Philip Garcia was taken to a California jail on a Wednesday morning in March of 2017. By Friday, he was dead. Riverside County withheld information about Garcia's death from his family, journalists, and federal monitors. But using public records laws, ProPublica obtained 17 hours of video and thousands of pages of records that shed light on Garcia's treatment in custody. We found that jail staff failed to address Garcia's urgent medical and mental health needs, even after determining he was in a psychiatric crisis. The videos show that deputies used violent force against Garcia and then lied about their treatment of him in reports. His death was ruled a homicide, but it didn't lead to any charges or discipline for anyone involved in his custody or care. The records provide an unusually thorough account of a recurrent tragedy, a person in mental crisis dying in law enforcement custody. It began when police responded to a call that Garcia was behaving bizarrely and out of character, throwing things at his neighbor's house. The 51-year-old repairman and father, shown here years earlier, was then arrested for allegedly assaulting his roommate. The police department declined our request for footage of his arrest and transport to the jail, but their reports make clear that Garcia was experiencing a mental health crisis. They say that Garcia was repeatedly banging his head against the barrier in the patrol car and yelling incoherently. We don't know everything about Garcia's health history or the treatment he received in jail. Much of his medical information was redacted and his family declined our request for interviews. But we do know that Garcia's wife told law enforcement at least twice that he suffered from a seizure disorder. Video of Garcia starts as officers lead him into the jail. During the booking process, Garcia appears unable to follow directions. We showed this footage to a mental health specialist who used to work at the jail. He appears to be agitated, obviously, but he's stumbling a little bit. And so you're reading into that is like, is that intoxication? Did he have a seizure and he's coming down from that? What's going on? Is he in the midst of a psychotic break? Deputies are supposed to collect Garcia's medical history and determine if a mental health assessment should be conducted, but jail staff don't write down any information about him. They abruptly stop questioning Garcia, later writing he was uncooperative. They take him to a cell, where he remains in isolation for 18 hours. Video from the cell's camera appears to malfunction showing only fragments of live action and then freezing on a single frame for long stretches of time. In the unfrozen moments, Garcia is behaving erratically. He claws at the light on the ceiling, jumps at the security camera, and wraps toilet paper around his body. By six the next morning, there's no evidence that mental health staff have seen Garcia or that he has slept or eaten for the last 18 hours. A sergeant decides to forcibly remove Garcia from the cell because he's damaging the ceiling light and could harm himself. Over the next several minutes, deputies use a barrage of weapons and force against Garcia. One would assume that they should be trained to de-escalate a person and not right away try to take them down. But it's been my observation, and once the, an inmate is to that level, it's their will against the inmate's will. The footage in the cell is frozen on a single frame when a deputy fires 30 rounds of pepper balls under the cell door, releasing a chemical that burns his eyes and airways. A few minutes later, a special team of deputies in riot gear prepares to remove Garcia from the cell. This deputy is about to throw a stinger grenade The device emits smoke, rubber pellets, and a loud bang. Garcia runs away from the grenade and is tackled by six deputies. Then smoke fills the cell, 
obstructing the camera. In their reports, several deputies write that they repeatedly punched Garcia as they struggled to handcuff him. Another deputy tases Garcia. Then deputies move him to an emergency restraint chair to immobilize his limbs and move him to another cell. He would never freely move his arms and legs again. An hour later, while jail staff remove the taser prongs from Garcia's side, a deputy places him in a painful salivary gland hold for 10 minutes. The way his, way his head's being held, like, how can he breathe? How can he swallow? Who deserves that? Nobody deserves that. Should somebody be trying to de-escalate the client? Yeah. We would have been, a mental health would not have been given an option. They're doing their thing. Around 9 a.m., a clinical therapist determines Garcia is in a psychiatric crisis and should be transferred to the county hospital. She's supposed to talk to Garcia face to face, but instead speaks to him through a hole in the door for just a few seconds. Deputies cover his face with a mesh and fabric hood to prevent him from spitting and wheel him out of the jail. Garcia arrives at the county hospital's emergency room at about 10 a.m. and waits all day for a bed. Video doesn't start until after Garcia has been moved to a special unit for inmates that night. His arms and legs have now been restrained for 15 hours. He needs medical care and a psychiatric evaluation. In the footage we reviewed, he doesn't receive either one. The standard of care is to assess an individual and to use the least restrictive measures as possible in any situation where you're dealing with a combative, agitated patient. And I don't believe the least restrictive measures were used in this case. Then you gotta hold on. 20. Deputies call in a tactical team to help move Garcia to a medical bed. One deputy is recording with a handheld video camera which the jail requires whenever deputies use force against inmates. Another deputy presses a plastic shield on top of Garcia's head and chest as the team moves and restrains him. While the deputies are redoing the restraints, Garcia cries out for help. Somebody's gonna help me! Somebody's gonna help me! Please, man! Seconds later, the deputy pushes down on the shield over Garcia's face with his full upper body weight. Two minutes later, he forces the shield down on Garcia again. In reports, the deputy holding the shield wrote that he didn't apply any direct pressure to Garcia's face and that Garcia was not struggling for breath. When the deputy removes the shield, blood is visible on Garcia's spit hood and his breathing is labored. By now, Garcia has been in custody for more than 33 hours, much of that time restrained and in distress. Persistent agitation comes most often from some type of medical condition that needs to be assessed in a hospital. It should be led from a medical perspective because it's a medical issue. A few minutes later, nurses want to attach a telemetry machine to monitor Garcia's heart. And they gotta do the telly. Where's the telly? Okay. Oh. Nine, two, three, two. Are, they're gonna put a telly on him. You guys, really? straight on the right arm. I don't. I don't think that's safe. Yeah. Really? That's that's not safe. <laughs> it's a basic sensors involved. Yeah, but the way he is right now, we gotta wait till he calms okay. down before we put that machine on there. That's not safe. Need my gloves, Regan. Deputies and medical staff have competing priorities security versus the patient's health. But the hospital is legally obligated to provide the same standard of medical care for inmates as for any other patient. Given the restraints, it's really important to take vitals. Ultimately, if, if you're not checking someone's breathing and, and blood pressure and circulation, uh, that can lead to serious consequences. 
Not connecting the tally means medical staff did not track Garcia's heartbeat, possibly missing crucial information as his condition worsened. A short while later, Garcia is sweating profusely. Records show that earlier that day, the emergency department diagnosed him with a life-threatening condition brought on by overexertion. It causes the body's muscles to break down and can lead to kidney failure. Struggling against the restraints for so many hours is causing Garcia to destroy muscle tissue, pouring toxins into his bloodstream. By 1047, Garcia has been restrained for 16 hours. Then the video ends, while three deputies and a state correctional officer are restraining him. It's the last image we have of Philip Garcia alive. He survives for three more hours, but the sheriff's department did not release footage from that time. Shortly after 2 a.m., Garcia stops breathing. Staff perform CPR, but it's too late. We know from the autopsy report that struggling against the restraints contributed to his death. The sheriff ruled that Garcia died at the hands of other people, making his death a homicide. The sheriff's department conducted an internal review of Garcia's death and did not discipline any deputies. Garcia's family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Riverside County. Their case could have exposed what happened to Garcia, but it never went to trial. The county denied the allegations and admitted no wrongdoing. It settled the suit by paying the Garcia family almost a million dollars, with the condition that the family not speak to the media about the case. When Garcia died, Riverside County was already on notice. The year before, a federal court ruled that the health care at county jails was woefully inadequate and ordered them to improve treatment of inmates. But court records and expert reports show that inmates there are still at serious risk of harm because of a lack of adequate medical and mental health care. When you're taken to jail in the middle of a mental health crisis, you shouldn't be treated like that and you shouldn't end up dying. 